Hello, and welcome to the Amber Stitt Show. I am your host, Amber Stitt, and today we welcome Kyle Christensen and David Mullen from the Unique Advantage team to the podcast today. So welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited. thanks, Amber. We're excited to be here. So this episode is dedicated for, to really anyone that wants to focus on what I call getting, getting money smart, but really using tools that can help you actively participate in the process of principle-based financial planning, but really using these the series of principles that you guys talk about within your program and on your team. So Kyle, I won't steal your thunder, but I love having a clear system on how to track my money goals. For those that are not as disciplined, why not have a system to help them as well? So it's kind of a win-win, I think, when I talk about this um, previously before meeting you. But for the audience that doesn't know you two yet, it's kind of a funny story because I I knew David prior, not too long, but really from a couple conferences from this year, we had been at some insurance conferences and had some fun talking about our business and we even attended a football game, David, and even though we were rooting for the Huskers, Nebraska football, they didn't do so well. We won't go into that whole mess, but we had some fun and we were talking, kind of nerding out about insurance and clients and maybe even the claim stories. So it was a nice bonding experience for us, right? And then you talked a lot about Kyle, your business partner, and then I was lucky enough to get the book, Principle Based financial planning, or what do we say, principles-based planning. And I read the, the book front to back and marked it up. And Kyle, I know I showed you my marks and I said, I'm sorry, but I couldn't help it. So that just means I really I enjoyed the information. So I thought I would love to share that, the information with my audience. So here we are. Um, so let's take a step back though, as I've kind of talked a bit about uh, how we've met, let's go a little bit into the background. Kyle, where did you come up with this and really, how did you get into the business and how did you and David team up and start working together? Yeah. So it's a little bit of a long story. I'll, I'll shorten it though. Um, I started in 1999 and, um, I was still in college at the time. So I was this, you know, young green eared you know, person that want, wanted to learn. I really just wanted to learn about money. And honestly, um, I always tell people that in my life, I've had more examples of what not to do than what to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that kind of drove me to want to be successful financially. And probably the most influential book that I read at the time uh, was Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And Basically, he said, look, the key to success is financial education, mm -hmm. right? And the difference between those who are rich and those who aren't is uh, the rich know how money works, right? They know what an asset is. They know what a liability is, and they don't confuse those things. So that kind of led me down this path. And um, long story short, I, I realized that the financial industry doesn't teach principles, right? The financial industry teaches products, and they teach – they teach people to make the wrong financial decision, and there's a reason for that, and maybe we'll talk about that at some point, The what I call the rules of financial institutions. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, over time, that's become more and more clear to me, and that's why I wrote the book and created a whole system that's all based on principles that, that actually create success. Yeah, I, I think it makes perfect sense. David, how did you kind of land in this uh, – world because I don't know that you always were in the planning space. No, no. I mean, I've, I've kind of gone all over the place. I've been, I mean, uh, there was a life in the past where it feels like I was kind of on the other side of things mm -hmm. where I was involved with commodities, global equities, alternative investments type realm. Um, out of college, I was working at a real estate investment company. Mm -hmm. So kind of a kind of a winding path. But my father was in the insurance industry his whole career, so I was exposed to kind of that side then as well. But um, I met Kyle just through uh, actually through some church things in the past. But we'd been friends for a mm -hmm. number of years and. Um, and he was he'd helped me out with some different things in the past. And one day he said, "Hey, mm -hmm. I I hate." bringing people into this, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you can do this. You know, I'd like to work with you. So if you want to, I'll, I'll teach you everything that I can. And I was like, all right, well, let's keep talking. So, mm -hmm. and the more that I heard about it, the more it resonated yeah. with, with what I felt, mm -hmm. with what makes sense with, um, I mean, it's cohesive yeah. with, with the overall view on, on life. It's so. almost like a breath of fresh air for me because 
Well, and what's nice about David being on the other side is that we can see other aspects and then really kind of formulate a decision or kind of the like what you your opinion on things because you can see how this can affect other people. And I know we're kind of high leveling this right now because people don't know what we're talking about. But David, you mentioned a different path and we have different pathways, hence the title of my podcast, Pathways to Peak Performance. There are so many ways to be involved in personal finance. And you don't have to be this, and I've talked with you guys about this, this accounting brain, you know, analytical numbers smart just to get the basic concepts down. And like we talked about, we don't learn about this when we're young. And I know that us collectively and our colleagues are really trying to teach our own children some of these uh, foundational elements with our kids being young. It's very important to us because we know it wasn't there for us outside of Kyle, you mentioned 1999. I think we're probably about the same age. So, you know, we had these classes that might have talked about checkbooks, maybe, but there was really nothing else besides if you wanted to be in a business course or like an internship in high school, there really wasn't anything. So luckily there's a lot more resources, but that's where um, we'll kind of talk more about um, the book and and your your process for your clients. Uh, But even um, another connection I feel like I had with you, Kyle, is that you mentioned a bunch of different titles of books in your book that you've written. And we were texting about a lot of these different books, but I think you at least have five that you mentioned, and there's a few more on your website. So I think if it's okay, I'm going to link up that page to your your um, website that shows all of those. I mean, how many books have you really kind of put in your arsenal of, you know, part of the um, kind of like that thought leadership for anyone can really tap into it. I mean, at least five books, I think, and maybe some videos. Right. Yeah. I mean, we feel like it's, it's great to have um, support and backing from people who are much more well-known than I am. Right. Uh, and they're, they're speaking to that specific principle or that topic or whatever and, uh, and supporting that. I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to say, Hey, go read rich dad, poor dad. Cause he talks about, investing in yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that's a principle that we teach. So it's nice to have not just from us, but from outside sources saying that, that the people generally view as very successful. Right. And they're saying, Hey, look, this is the right thing too. You know, and I love that backing. So I have a lot, I mean, I read a ton of books. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've read 17 books this year mm-hmm. and I, I just love adding more to the, to the list. Yep. So no, I have, David already, I already ordered a bunch of books when I was hanging out with David for like one day. So at least I have an excuse for my my book habit. But not everyone loves to read, so there's obviously other things you can do through uh, videos and audiobooks and so on. So I kind of want to see where you want to begin. But the kind of wealth creation kind of stands out to me, and the velocity of money stands out to me. So. I'll let you begin with kind of what you want to share with, you know, high level. What do you want people to know today? If they can take, have a couple takeaways today, let's leave the audience with some things that they can apply now. And then of course, if they need additional help, you know, we have the teams available to them, but um, let's have you kick it off with um, reformatting or kind of how we think about the mindset of money. Um, So what do you think? I think people need to know that they're in a battle over their money. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think that they know that they're in that battle. I, you know, I've, I've seen this bumper sticker. In fact, I have it. It says my money talks and mine always says goodbye. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of truth to that, right. That the people, one of the hardest challenges in life, right. Is holding on to your money. Well, why is that? It's, it's because there is a force out there that is making a constant effort to take it away from you. Um, because whoever can control your money is who's going to create wealth, right? So I think, I think primarily what, what I would want to tell your audience or tell anybody that I talk to is, look, you've got to make your effort to be in control of your money throughout your lifetime, right? And know that there are forces that are working against you trying to take that away. And they, and they do it in a subtle way. They do it in a way that sounds good. Right. That they're going to take care of you. Right. You've you've heard this phrase. One of my favorite movie is uh, movies is night and day mm-hmm. with uh, Tom Cruise. Mm-hmm. Do you like that movie? <laughs> Maybe I like Tom Cameron Cruise Diaz. back in the day. He's still he's still. Yeah, he's still pretty cool. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, my favorite scene in that is when Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz are talking about like, OK, 
some people are going to come after you and they're going to say they're from the government and they're going to say that they're here to help you and they're going to take you to a safe place and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, that just means they're going to kill you. And, <laughs> you know, she's like, what? You know, and I just think, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to bad mouth the entire financial services industry, yeah. but the reality is, is their their objective is to get control and use of your money. And their their objective is not to make you financially free. Right. That's not their goal. It's not a conspiracy theory that you're, you're throwing out here. You're, we're basically saying, looking at who is controlling the dollars and then kind of putting it on autopilot. And this is before a COVID. And, and the reason I feel like I resonated with you guys and David when we first were talking about this is that I had developed the Pathways of Peak performance kind of like 2020 as I'm thinking about how do people do things with resilience because things are going to happen and people are not properly proactively putting things in motion, taking action today for some of these forces or these things that are happening. So we're talking about just, you could get sick, you can have um, a sabbatical or a maternity leave. There's things that you're going to do to maybe that might halt the, the earning potential, a disability. But then we're putting all of these dollars into these accounts that we really have no control over. And I think that's what you're talking about, correct? It's, it's having that awareness and not just letting it be so, but putting some skin in the game, some sweat equity into participating with where your, your dollars are going. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like that is the message that I'm feeling from you guys. And Kyle and I were talking the other day about some of the underlying forces, and because it's it's not the financial services industry that's the enemy necessarily, it's it's our natural instincts of wanting something that's easy, mm-hmm. of um, Atomic Habits. We talked mm-hmm. about that book, I think, right? Um, it's just kind of all the rage right now, but it's a great book. Um, but he talks about um, the behavior of wanting to fit in with the crowd and being popular. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing is even with social media and we see a lifestyle around us that we are yearning for. So between, I think, those three factors, um, I think financial institutions very easily speak to the easy Mm -hmm. route and to the popular route because they've made it seem popular. And those are, it's hard to break away from our natural tendencies to want to feed into those. Um, but that's what we just need to be aware of. Well, and that's, I think, the right? point, Kyle, when you're mentioning other people that have created wealth. You talked about Warren Buffett. It actually surprised me some of the things you mentioned about him. He's different than I thought because you just assume <laughs> he's just, you know, making all, yeah. he's obviously making money in the stock market, but he doesn't think like you would think he does, given if you don't take the time to invest in learning a little bit more. That's what I love about this this whole mindset is that we really have to take back some control within our own selves. And so I, I, I teach this a bit, uh, back to the pathways, uh, the focus on talents. I really, my program starts with knowing who you are, how do you receive information, don't be upset and try to fix who you are not. So if you got that dialed in and then you dial that in with your partner, spouse, or whoever, you understand how things might tick and work for you. But from there, build some of these goals around who you are, but you have to you have to do some of the work, right, Kyle? Work is a principle, right? <laughs> and it always has been. I mean, um, I've got a quote <clears throat> behind me on the wall. You probably can't see it, but uh, with a picture of Booker T. Washington next to it, because it's a quote from him from Up From Slavery, uh, which is a fantastic book. And um, he, he says that anything worthwhile requires work. Mm-hmm. You know, anything that's that's that that is long lasting and valuable is is going to require work. And so you think about that and I and I like David's comment that you know what really hurts people financially is is their natural tendency, right? I mean, think about it from a health standpoint, right? My natural tendency is not to go lift weights and go right. exercise and, you know, I just want to eat whatever I want to mm-hmm. eat. Well, that's going to lead me predictably to an outcome that I don't right. really want. So, so the same thing applies with money, right? If you are not actively resisting your natural tendencies mm-hmm. when it comes to your money, you're going to fail financially. It's predictable. Yeah. The outcome is predictable. Yeah. And a lot of that plays into what's the easy route that I can go with my money to make more. And that kind of connects what both of you just said there too. Warren Buffett has a great phrase where he, he refers to people who – 
who help with money. He calls them the helpers. Yeah, I know. That's but something I But he talks about actually the detrimental effect of them, right? Yeah. And, and the fees and all the they're, – they're trying to help, but they're trying to help us do the easy road that doesn't require work. And there's a cost to that. That, that most of us just don't realize. Well, back to the analogy. If you eat better, you feel better, right? You work out, you feel better, you're more flexible. So if you understand where your money's going and you can make some choices, that's got to feel good too. And that's yeah. basically when I talk about these proactive steps. Do things while you're healthy and well. When things kind of throw the curveball, you know, you're going to have one or two, maybe more, then you can that stress level can be maintained. And I think, David, I maybe mentioned this at one of the conferences, but we had a health scare with my husband with some labs that came back that were not good, and it was they were mishandled or someone else's labs came through. So he got the phone call. And what people don't, didn't know is we had spreadsheets and other uh, folders and apps that help protect our information. To So like if something happens to one of us, we can just go there. We don't have to blink and go, where are things? People go, you guys are kind of crazy that that you were so autopilot and surgical about getting the news, but we didn't have we didn't need to overstress ourselves with the where is everything and what would we do if this was a real problem? The emergency kind of that strategy was already pre-built and we had an, an exercise. But that's also after having that a couple of years ago, I want people to have that same feeling. It feels really good to know what's going on and not just kind of closing your eyes, that buy and hold thought process of just don't look, just deal with it later. And that's just not very wise given what we've seen um, in our business and just personally as we've been either employees, spouses, have children, and then business ownership too. So um, we've kind of seen it all, but we can go back and trust these other people like we've been talking about, people you're sourcing in the book. Um, they, they have the, his, the historical elements are there for us to kind of pay attention to. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, and and it really made me think of the protection area of people's finances, right? Where they're just kind of hoping that things don't happen to yeah. them um, because they don't really know, right? Mm-hmm. They they don't have that. Like, I I think it's awesome that you had all those things, the resources, and you were surgical about it, and you could not panic yep. when the news came, right? Well, how many people are in that situation with their protection of their finances? They're, or are they just hoping things don't happen to them? Um, I think, unfortunately, the lack of uh, financial literacy and the, the way the financial services industry sells products, right? Um, people just are unprepared. They, yeah. they don't know what they have. They, they don't, they're not really prepared. In fact, one of the questions I ask every client is, how well prepared do you think most people are for all these things that could possibly go wrong uh, financially? And they say, not well. And so then we talk about the three reasons why that is. And uh, it's really, I think, helpful for them to see that. There was a colleague I spoke with uh, a couple weeks ago, and he mentioned that he's been doing 11 years worth of research on the neuroscience, the brain science behind the fear factor of really thinking about the what ifs. So I think you have a, per- there's a perfect point there. I think marketing companies know that people are naturally inclined in their brain to kind of shy away from the scary things. My husband's one of those. He's more of an easygoing, um, kind of fly by the seat of his pants. He's a fun, he's fun, but he is not that responsible one. Someone has to be, and it's me. And we joke about it, but I mean, he'd rather kind of just go, I don't want to talk about it. everything will be okay. There's so many of them out there, and, and, and it's okay, but what are we going to do with that? So do you want to talk about your, your three steps at a high level today? The, the three reasons why people are not prepared mm-hmm. financially or from the protection? Yeah, I mean, the first reason is that people are uneducated, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not trying to be yep. mean, but you know, what percentage of the population buys auto insurance, just as an easy example? Because you Hopefully have to, all of them, though, right? Right. Right. And, but how much education do they get when they buy oh, it? No. How, one of the questions, one of the questions we ask our clients is how did you decide the levels of coverage that you have? And I think even me asking that question, they're like, Oh, I didn't even know I could decide. You know, it's, it's just mm-hmm. what the, what the agent gave me or what I could afford at the time, you know? Yep. And, and as they say those words, they know that that's not a good reason to have the coverages that they have. And so, you know, there's a lack of education. Number one, they don't know what their options are. Number two, 
they don't think it's going to happen to them, mm-hmm. right? I think generally that's good. You know, <laughs> you, you wake up thinking, right, hey, I'm gonna not going to get in an accident. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to have cancer today. You know, right. um, that's good. We should be optimistic about that. But do, do those things still happen to people? Yeah. Yeah. Those things still happen to people. People still get in car accidents that didn't expect it. Mm-hmm. People get a lab result that they didn't expect at some yep. point, you know, um, things happen. And, and so, you know, feeling like I'm invincible, it's never going to happen to me. That's not a good way to prepare, right. right? That's not why you have protection. That's not why you have auto insurance, right? right? Uh, or homeowners or disability or et cetera, right? The third reason is because they think it's going to cost too much. Mm-hmm. OK, so let me ask you this. If you don't know what your options are, do you really know what it's going to cost? Right. You don't. So it's actually the perception. It's the perception of the cost. We see this all the time. You know, people will have like just and I'm picking on auto insurance because it's the first thing on the model that we use uh, in the protection area. If you have a hundred thousand dollar liability limit and I say to you, hey, Amber, you should get a million dollar umbrella policy. What do you think your premium is going to look like? It sounds like a huge jump. You're talking about a lot of money, a million dollars. Huge jump. What? Yeah. Yeah. Like 10 times what you already yeah. have. And and so people are pleasantly surprised when we say, well, actually, mm-hmm. it's probably going to be somewhere around 150 bucks a year or 200 bucks yeah. a year. Go to your PNC agent and get a quote for it and let's find yeah. out. And, uh, you know, and then we tell them some other little tricks of the trade so that they can actually, in some cases, save money. You know, they can have 10 times the liability coverage they have for no cost. Did they have any clue? You know, and and here's the other thing. I think the industry, especially on the insurance side, is so price focused, so premium focused Mm -hmm. that they're shooting themselves in the foot because you and I and David, we would all pay more for a better meal at a better Mm -hmm. restaurant. Right. We would all pay more for a better experience. Right. And. People will pay more if they understand the why behind their coverages and they feel like, hey, I chose this. I know what I I know why I'm paying for this. Right. And, you know, in most cases, they'll they'll pay more to have better protection. Right. No, I, right? Yeah, I agree with that. The thing that's funny about the uh, auto and home is I have, I've had people not know that their jewelry <laughs> is not covered. Their wedding sets, their bands. And so they go, yeah, I have the endorsement. No, you have the basics. And so what's interesting about the, it's not all agents, but like you said, ask some of these questions because I would think the person that is selling the product would say, we have these 10 things. What do you need? But I don't think those questions are, they're rarely asked. And so you're really can be underinsured a lot of times. So I always tell people, especially around the wedding season, hey, by the way, just make sure you got to get that jewelry because I've had even someone lost a piece of jewelry and was pretty bummed out when they did not have the coverage. So, but um, ask the questions. Yeah. It's your life, you know, we have to participate in learning more and, and protecting. And well, and a lot of it, a lot of it through our process actually goes back to even understanding why too. Mm-hmm. So why even do we have auto insurance? I talked with a, a great guy uh, just a couple of days ago and he was so funny because we started talking about auto insurance. I was like, why do we have that? He's like, oh, I think it's a scam. And, (laughs) you know, it's they're just protecting your car and that's it. And it went on and on about it. And it was, yeah, in his mind, it was totally a scam if all it's doing is protecting your car. And then his wife chimed in, well, what if we hurt someone? Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And love his wife. She's awesome too. And, <laughs> but it was perfect. It was like, okay, I'll slide you a 20 afterwards. Right. <laughs> but, but it was, but it got to the root cause. It was like, well, what's the more expensive part? Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and at the end of the conversation, he was like, oh my gosh, you like totally flipped me on my head with, with how I understand this. Like, how come nobody ever talked to me about this? Well, before? I like your approach. I mean, um, you're really going and explaining things that people are, are actively putting money into, whether they have to or not. I don't know that other planning teams really dial into the education of some of the basics that we've had since we were kids driving our first car. So I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. But really pointing out some of the, like the basics. I think sometimes people, you know, you, you hear about this with an IRA and people go, oh yeah, HSA, I know what that is. But people nod their heads a lot, but just it's, they don't want to look incompetent because they don't know. But how about we all just agree that it's okay that you're, if you're not a specialist in that area, you don't have to know all of those things, but get, 
get dialed in and find an expert that can help you with that. It's your life. It's your right. money. So, and I, I think kind of, um, maybe you guys can talk a little, or actually Kyle, let's go back to the movie up. We talked about movies. You mentioned something about the life of the old man and everyone just like, we all want to, we're all crying watching the movie and maybe our kids are not even there. And we're watching it. It's possible. Um, hard, hard, hard for me to admit that, but yes, yes that's just, <laughs> but you know, the point I think is that we know that people tend to, you mentioned something earlier and I, I can't remember what it was exactly, but we know historically when people get to a point of transition, most people are not prepared and ready to go and the money not, might not be there. And so I think you speak to that. I don't know if the movie Up had something to kind of paint this picture, but um, tell me a little bit more about what you were talking about within your book on that. Yeah. So the reason I brought that story up is because if, if you remember the husband and wife, you know, they have this dream that they're saving money for, right? And, and then life happens to them, right? Things happen mm -hmm. and they have to take money out of that piggy bank and now they start over, right? right? So they, they fill it up and they start over and they fill it up and they start over and they fill it up and they start over and then they never accomplish their objective, right? So the point of it is, you know, we really want our money to work for us, right? We, we don't want to always work for money. Um, money is a, is a bad slave driver, mm -hmm. right? It is not kind. It makes you work even when you, sh even when you can't, right? Even when you're having a hard time. Yep. Um, so we always want to get to, or we want to get to the point where money is working for us and people rarely get there. Well, why is that? It's because they're number one, they're just not saving enough money. Right. Uh, only 39% of Americans have a thousand dollars available for unexpected expenses. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Only 39%. So 61% of the nation doesn't even have a thousand dollars that they could access for any reason. Right. So, and, and you know, but that's not, now we take that 39% and how many of them have, you know, enough that they could cover unexpected life events and also put money towards real investments, assets that produce income. Yeah. Right. Cause that takes money, right? Cash is king. Yeah. And, and, so, you know, and David, you mentioned something about the atomic habits and the social media. I mean, why spend money to show off success to other people? Why do, why do we need to do, why would people need to do that? Why are they doing that in Arizona and Scottsdale? People do this. Wouldn't it just be more amazing to know that everything is set and no one has to know, but you know that your family is safe. Imagine that, like that could give like a little sparkle in your eye and why no one else has to know. And I think we, we see that when we talk with other uh, planners that might even talk about like Tom Hegna mentioned something about never buy a new car. And so he goes, my wife will, but okay, do the math, you know, some of the basics there, but why not celebrate and just have some like humility behind the scenes? Who cares what other people think? You know, you don't have to, to flash that success. It could just be within. And I think your team is really trying to help people get there. That's so funny because last year I bought a, a truck and I was looking at new yeah. ones and my wife was like, I just don't want the image of a brand new truck, you know? Is that the image? <laughs> like, like, all right, sweetie. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, she just didn't want, you know, she's like, I don't want people to look at us that way. And I was like, okay, that's fine. But I found a great truck that was a couple years old and it's, I love it. So here's the tricky you know I mean? part. We are looking at the Hyundai Palisade calligraphy and it's, it's luxury leather where, and it's 50,000, not a bad price for luxury. Like we're like, normally those would be a hundred with the, the bucket seat. So we're having this problem where we're like, do we do this or not? Because it fits our family, but it's got all the luxury bells and whistles. It's a pretty budget friendly, but it's a new car. So we're still thinking about that, but they're not even out on the market. <laughs> uh, the one that we want. So and again, but if you're doing things right and you want to make that decision, but then real reallocate where you might be saving in other areas, you, you know, you can do that if you're doing the right steps, I suppose. So is there anything today that people can walk away with, you know, if we're going to do anything and it's just someone needs the baby steps might be like my husband. I need a couple things. I can't commit, can't dive in fully to a full financial plan, whatever their, the people's stories or the resistance is. What do you guys think people can just start doing today? If they're listening to us today, I think, uh, being 100% responsible, 
So we have to be responsible for our own lives. Mm -hmm. And it's only when we acknowledge that that we can start to move forward. And I think it starts with really learning Mm that. So learning from good teachers, learning from good books. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, podcasts like this, right, can be very, very helpful. But but we need to learn so that we can at least understand if something is in our best interest or not. And we need to have that working knowledge because that's that's going to reduce a lot of our risk. It's going to it's going to give us a lot of experience that can be learned from other people yeah. um, in that process. Yeah. All right. I'm going to give them one. So it's called the principle of accountability. Everybody knows it, right? People need to be accountable. And, and it kind of goes along with what David's saying, right? Um, if I came to you and I said, hey, I've got this great investment, you know, this business opportunity uh, that you can invest into, but the person who runs it, he doesn't know how much money's coming in and how much is going out. Do you still want to do it? Do you still want to invest in that business? Hmm. You wouldn't, right? No. Yeah, you would. You wouldn't. You would walk away immediately, right? Because you know that it's going to fail, right? Why is it that on an individual level, people don't know exactly what's coming in and exactly what's going out? You know, and how is that going to work out? If it, if we know for sure that business is going to fail because they don't do it, how? How would that be any different on the personal level? Yeah. So I would say you've got to know what's coming in and what's going out. I'm not a huge fan, honestly, of budgets, but I am a huge fan of consciousness. Yeah. So being conscious and aware. I like that because I was talking with my sister and we, there's all types of personality assessments. I'm a big fan of the Gallup uh, Strength Finders. And so she was talking about her goal setting and she's not making certain goals happen. And I said, why, why do you have to do these? They call it, you know, the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goals, or I think that's how you say it. Build these money goals or your goals based upon how you, how you tick and don't try to change that. So yes, it doesn't have to be all these metrics, outcomes, numbers. I think the, the consciousness is perfect because make it work for you and how what makes you happy? I say create your own happiness, but it starts with, like we've all talked about, this personal development phase and taking responsibility and, and knowing how, how we work. And then if we can team up with our, our partners, our spouses, and just be okay with the fact. I mean, I always think how successful can these plans be, or we might not say the word financial plan if we're talking about just having this, the, the following principles, but if we understand people are different and we're okay with that and we can connect and just see the positives of how people are built differently, let's, we should celebrate that. And then we can build whatever the goals might be around that, but it doesn't have to be a ton. It doesn't have to be on a certain timetable, but just implementation, I think, and having that awareness, right? Absolutely. And I, th- I think with a lot of advisors, people feel like they need to be in a good financial position before they talk with someone too. That's interesting. And um, I just started talking with some friends and they, they brought that up and they were very, they're like, man, this is kind of, we wanted to wait until we had some more money after we sold the house and we had a bunch in our accounts and stuff and we could look good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's kind of like a physical going to the doctor, you know, this is uncomfortable. You flash your teeth so, right but, before the dental appointment. That's, <laughs> that's right. So, but they were like, we're so glad we're here because this is actually helping us know the habits that we can do to get right. us to that better place. Now. Yeah. We, we, we so. need to know it's possible and some other yeah. ideas and collaborating can help you brainstorm for other things that could help you and your family. Yeah. Well, and I gave him Kyle's book here recently yeah. and he read through that in like two days yeah. and he's like, Oh my gosh, I've been doing everything wrong. So then he's like, okay, now we got to talk and how, how can I start building this the right way? So yeah. it is, it's, it's learning and, and growing and, and just starting to, Starting to learn what we yeah, can. Yeah, you know, the work smarter, not harder. There are some principles. Tom, uh, Tim Ferriss talks about the four-day work week. And all of that's good, but you still have to do some of the work. You know, figuring out the system that works for you. But you gotta, you got to start with yourself. And so I really appreciate you guys being here. And I'm going to, within the, the podcast show notes and then the description box on YouTube, I'll just link up information and let people know how they can find you guys, find the book. And um, Kyle, I think you have it on uh, Amazon, so we'll link that up. And I um, really appreciate you guys being here today. So for the audience, I appreciate you being here as well. I hope that you can take a couple things away today um, to help you and your families. But thank you for being here today. Yeah, just improve their place. So thank yeah. you so much, Amber. We appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us on today's episode of The Amber Stitch Show. For more information about the podcast, books, articles, and more, please visit me at amberstitt.com. Until next week, enjoy your journey at home and at work. Thank you for listening.